So I uh, wanted to welcome everyone uh, here to uh, our inaugural CIFAR seminar series. And um, uh, first, I'd like to uh, thank our guest musicians, uh, Bob Brumbelow on guitar and Tomoko Funaki on bass. It's, um, it's, it, oh, it's, it's, um, it is uh, uh, it's not so early for um, uh, the uh, HIV researchers and clinicians, but it is early for jazz musicians. So, um, so we thank them for being with us today. Um, so, it's um, this this is our first uh, CFAR seminar series that we're starting out. It's a particularly poignant day, uh, as many of you know. Uh, our CFAR director Monica Gandhi, or our, our close friend and colleague um, uh, lost her husband Rakesh uh, just a few short days ago. Um, he had a long battle with um, salivary gland cancer, and uh, and uh, he um, uh, has been dealing with this for the past uh, decade, and uh, and Monica uh, uh, as well. Um, he was a beloved professor in the cardiology division uh, division at the VA. Uh, and um, with unwavering support from Monica, fought courageously against his illness. Uh, and, and during his illness, he inspired his patients, his trainees, his colleagues with his courage, his humor, his dignity, and his quiet grace. He was also a beloved husband uh, and father who instilled the same moral compass, curiosity, and love for learning and there are two sons, uh, Ishan and Vedant. Monica, too, inspired us with her steadfast support of Rakesh and the boys throughout his illness, all the while while maintaining uh, and, and managing to support our community uh, as one of uh, our finest researchers, educators, and mentors, as a clinic director of Ward 86, as a scientific chair of AIDS 2020, and now as our CIFAR director and now our community needs to rally around her and the boys in their time of need. On this World AIDS Day, uh, we can think back uh, to the history of the HIV epidemic in San Francisco, all the achievements uh, and all the challenges that lie ahead. But one of the defining characteristics of the San Francisco response has always been togetherness. Uh, people living with HIV and AIDS, activists, healthcare workers, clinical researchers, basic researchers, all uh, came together uh, to face uh, this epidemic. And it was that togetherness that got us where we are today. That's that togetherness that will get us uh, to zero in the future. And part of that sense of togetherness is that we support each other in times of need. This is one of those times for Monica. Many of you uh, got an email from Diane uh, with a link to a web page, or if uh, if you would like, you can make a donation to help uh, with uh, little things that the family needs in this time, uh, delivery of food. Uh, to make things just a little bit easier and to let her know that we care. We, we have also, uh, we have some cards uh, in the back uh, that we'd uh, like you to pick up and uh, write, a, write a brief note to Monica, uh, show her your support uh, during this time, which I think will make a big difference. And we'll, we'll collect them and give them to her so I'd like to, before we go further, take a moment of silence uh, to acknowledge Rakesh's passing uh, and to send our thoughts and prayers to Monica and the boys. So as I said, this is our inaugural uh, uh, CIFAR um, uh, seminar series. Um, 
It's appropriate, as you know, uh, we originally had scheduled Tony Fauci to come. Um, I'll get to that in a little bit later. We've, uh, uh, he was called to testify in, in front of Congress today. Hopefully that means preserving an NIH budget for all of us uh, so that we can continue doing what we're doing. Um, uh, and he uh, has reached out to us this morning, actually, with a, a probable rescheduled uh, date. Uh, but um, uh, in, uh, uh, Monica wanted us to go forward with today, um, uh, and it's fitting that um, we have three um, uh, early stage investigators uh, that uh, will be representing our community today here at the seminar as in, in our first uh, uh, kickoff. Um, when Monica became CIFAR director, the very first thing she wanted to do uh, was support our early stage investigators um, as robustly as we can. Uh, and so what better way to uh, start the uh, CIFAR seminar series and to honor uh, three of some of our finest uh, early stage investigators today representing different uh, parts of science uh, across our community. Um, after today's event, we're going to have uh, monthly uh, seminars, uh, the first Wednesday, uh, generally speaking, every month um, uh, from 9 to 10, uh, uh, following HIV Grand Rounds. Um, those of you who come to that meeting uh, can, can just stay on for the extra hour. Uh, those of you uh, who may be interested in hearing a bit about clinical HIV and who don't uh, normally come to that conference, it's a good opportunity for you to get uh, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, a little bit more enrichment uh, uh, in, in those mornings. Uh, it'll be here in Carr Auditorium. Um, uh, we'll have external and internal speakers of note, um, uh, but the first year we, uh, we are inviting in a lot of outside speakers um, uh, that we think will be of high interest uh, to our community. Um, what we're trying to do is pair each outside speaker uh, with uh, one early stage investigator speaker who works in the same general area um, uh, so that we'll have sort of paired presentations. Uh, we'll also include uh, early stage investigator lunches um, with our outside visiting speakers. Um, uh, so uh, if you have ideas for speakers uh, or people you would like to nominate uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to speak uh, with uh, uh, some of the outside speakers, please do forward us an email uh, here and, and, and please uh, do get involved. Uh, this is a snapshot of the next uh, year of our uh, uh, scheduled uh, seminar series. We have Steve Shoptow uh, coming in January uh, with uh, Amy Conroy um, uh, as, our, uh, uh, as our local uh, uh, colleague uh, to present along with him. And, um, uh, Bob Silicano coming uh, in February with uh, Michael Peluso uh, uh, presenting as well. Uh, Mike Magavero from UAB, uh, Beatrice Hahn, Judy Courier, uh, Sharon Hillier, uh, among other speakers uh, uh, lined up. Um, uh, Tonia Potit, um, uh, Ada Adamora, uh, Betty Korber, uh, and then of course uh, Tony Fauci, which we've just heard probably April 20th is the date. That's going to be an exception. We'll make an exception for Tony Fauci on the day. It won't be a Wednesday. It'll be a Monday. We figured we would we would, we would make an exception. Um, uh, and for today's uh, uh, presenters, I'm going to turn the podium um, over to Mallory, uh, who will introduce uh, our, our speakers. Thank you, Peter, both for the, uh, for the music. I'm impressed and, um, wow, uh, <laughs> I can't compete with that. A talented scientist and a musician, so uh, fantastic. Um, so I, I thought I'd just spend just a couple of moments just reflecting on where we are in <clears throat> this World AIDS Day and the ep epidemic. And I think it's important just to keep in mind the enormous uh, progress that we've made in HIV treatment and prevention and with the powerful array of tools that we have. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, with the serious uh, and um, uh, discussions of ending the HIV epidemic and the continued uh, progress toward new discovery and serious uh, efforts toward HIV cure. I think it's amazing to think of where we are now uh, from where we've come just a few short years and certainly a couple of decades ago. Um, however, with this, there is a heightened need uh, for continued progress. And I think although we have these tools, there needs a lot of work to be done getting treatment and prevention to the people who need it, when they need it, where they need it, uh, and also how they need it. So I think um, 
starting off our seminar, seminar series with our early stage investigators representing the next uh, rounds of innovation and progress in the HIV epidemic is, is perfectly suited uh, to what we're, where we are at the epidemic and on this World AIDS Day. So um, as Peter said, we have three uh, investigators that we will be hearing from today. And um, I, I will I have the honor of introducing the first one, and that is going to be Matthew Spinelli. Um, Matt is a fourth year infectious disease fellow uh, in the Division of HIV, ID, and Global Medicine at, at here at, ZF, at ZSFG. Um, his research focuses on interventions to improve adherence and retention in care for HIV treatment and PrEP, as well as the development of HIV PrEP adherence measurement approaches. Uh, his current projects include exploring the use of urine point of care drug testing, drug level testing to enhance uh, and target adherence counseling interventions for both PrEP and HIV treatment. Today, Matt's going to be sharing his work, uh, which is entitled Enhancing PrEP Efficacy Using Urine Point of Care Adherence Monitoring. Um, so I'm happy to invite Matt up to share his exciting work with us. Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, honored to be here. Thank you. Um, so uh, my talk is uh, entitled Using Point-of-Care Drug Level Testing to Enhance Adherence Counseling and Provide Differentiated Care. So uh, as a, just to give background that, that most of you will be aware of, the, the two drugs that are currently approved for pre-exposure prophylaxis are both tenofovir-based, uh, TDF-FTC, and uh, FTAF, which is uh, uh, only, only approved uh, in certain subpopulations. They're highly effective to prevent HIV, and we have been seeing a rising uptake here in San Francisco and in a few other districts, so certainly not everywhere, uh, but here we uh, estimate that up to 50% of San Francisco MSM have used PrEP in the prior year. Um, however, when we look later in the, in the cascade, PrEP adherence remains a challenge. Uh, in some demonstration projects, we've seen that 66 to 78% of, uh, of, of people have had low adherence and uh, with marked adherence challenges in young MSM and black and Latino MSM. Why do we care about adherence to PrEP? Uh, not everyone who stops PrEP does so because they're no longer at risk of HIV. Uh, we've seen at least 18 HIV infections in people who stop PrEP at the city clinic. Um, looking elsewhere, an HIV incidence of 3.9 per 100 person years in people who stop PrEP in Montreal that incidentally is exactly the same HIV incidence of the placebo arm of the first PrEP clinical trial. Uh, IPREX. And then uh, when we compare times that people are on PrEP to after they stop, we see much higher inf incidence after people stop PrEP, uh, up, up to eight-fold higher here in San Francisco. So um, it, it is true that we've seen um, many HIV infections of people who stop PrEP. Um, we also have seen that um, adherence um, if we look at one PrEP demonstration project, the U.S. PrEP demo project, that adherence uh, will, will tend to drop off in, in people before they eventually go on to stop PrEP. This is uh, retrospectively looking at some adherence data. And we found that uh, most, most PrEP users had at least one visit where uh, they had low adherence prior to discontinuing PrEP altogether. And uh, adherence, uh, in this case, is a marker of PrEP ambivalence and risk of stopping PrEP. There it is. Um, uh, and what we saw in that project and in, and in other projects is that, unfortunately for PrEP, self-reported adherence is, is quite unreliable. This is just uh, the most notable example. Um, uh, in, the, in two large PrEP studies in, in women in sub-Saharan Africa, the VOICE and FEM PrEP studies, in spite of seeing self-reported adherence uh, over 90% and high return pill counts, when we actually went and measured people's uh, plasma tenofovir levels, only about a quarter of them had taken any drug at all. Um, 
so that's all well and good and uh, objective adherence monitoring is one tool that, that can give us an objective look at people's adherence. Unfortunately, the, the methodology we have to do that requires, well, it's not, I, I guess I shouldn't say unfortunately, but the current uh, methods to measure PrEP drugs uh, require liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry, which although accurate is an expensive machine to own or rent, uh, you need trained personnel to operate it. And because of that, there's really only uh, one or two places where you can do drug level testing, and that results in sample processing and shipping time that, um, that makes it not uh, scalable for clinical settings. So how can you bring drug level testing to the point of care? Um, the way you do that is you use antibody-based testing. Uh, some analogies of this technology are the urine pregnancy test or the GLAC demanding TB test. And um, when you use uh, what's called a, a lateral flow amino assay to, to develop a point of care test, it's, it's a very low cost technique. It can be performed by untrained personnel um, or even by the patient themselves. Uh, and you have a, a quick turnaround time. An important caveat about tenofovir drug level measurement is that when we measure tenofovir in the urine or in the plasma, um, we are measuring uh, adherence over the prior week. So it is a short-term drug level measurement. We contrast that to drug, dried blood spot testing, which measures adherence over six weeks. Unfortunately, point of care um, antibody-based testing doesn't allow us to have that, that type of uh, a measure. Um, but I'm very excited to report, uh, as I've reported in this setting and in others, uh, we uh, uh, have isolated uh, an antibody to tenofovir. Um, this was with, a, with collaboration of uh, Alia Rapid Diagnostics. And we developed an, uh, an ELISA test to measure drug levels using that antibody. We've uh, subsequently published on, on validation of, of the, that test against spectrometry-based methods. And then the ultimate, test, the ultimate step is to develop that into the, the actual point-of-care test. And we, uh, as of about March of this year, we've done that. And this is a, uh, a diagram, uh, not to scale. It's about 1.5 centimeters. Um, the urine cup, I, I realized uh, after, maybe <laughs> messes with your sense of scale. Um, so. Uh, uh, it, it's a small, it's a small test. Uh, so we uh, we subsequently validated the the test, and uh, I'm going to be presenting data at at Croy, um, where we looked at diverse patient populations, including from the Partners Prep study, uh, which include uh, cisgender men and women in several African countries, and the Ibris study, which included transgender men and women taking gender affirming hormone therapy, and we looked to see how accurate this test was and. Uh, in those 324 participants, excited to report, it's, it's, it has 99.6% uh, accuracy. So it's, it's, a, it's a very good antibody and a very good test. And uh, I've, I've previously re reported here where we've, we've looked at uh, our, our, our urine drug level testing and shown that uh, low urine drug levels are associated with future HIV infections. So we've, we've clinically validated and um, now uh, laboratory validated the point of care test. So I think the, the next step is how do we use this test? I think a lot of people have a lot of questions about what would, what would be the implementation of this and how, um, how could we fit this into clinical care. And um, a lot of this work arose out of the PrEP field and the PrEP adherence measurement field, so I'm going to focus on that. Um, but I will just touch on a use case for HIV treatment that's come up. So. Um, Coming out of these studies where we learned that really objective adherence measurement was necessary to understand adherence in PrEP trials, uh, quickly that moved on to could we use objective adherence measurement to improve adherence, and that was the, the concept of drug level feedback. So the, the first study of that in PrEP came out of the uh, IPREX study, the, the add-on, the open label extension. And they did a small sub-study where they used, uh, they used drug level testing and then fed that back to patients and asked them um, what sort of impact that they thought that would have on their adherence. Some people felt like it uh, was motivating, it solidified that, that your efforts are in vain. Others felt like, I know what my adherence is, so I, I know when I take my meds, this isn't relevant. Um, and the delays that occurred were uh, not surprisingly, um, if we're testing, uh, decreased the relevance. So adherence feedback, if we do it, it should be real time as possible. And it, it, information alone is not enough. It has to be contextualized and motivational and lead to next steps. Building on that, uh, that study, uh, two uh, later studies, uh, which have just recently been published, uh, Landovitz and colleagues the, in the PATH prep study in Los Angeles, 
use plasma drug level testing to uh, and, and use it to target and incorporate it into, into a, a type of uh, motivational interviewing based adherence counseling. This was much more acceptable uh, than the prior study and it was actually quite effective. You can see here in this uh, this line graph, people moving from the red um, undetectable levels into the detectable levels of plasmatinafivir. They did have delays, however, of three weeks, which they, they felt like decreased their impact. A similar approach was uh, tested in young African women in HPTN 2 That hasn't been published yet, but what, from what we've heard, um, there were a lot of operational challenges that, that led to the study not really working. Again, dry blood spot testing done in one lab in Colorado, um, two month, that re resulted in two month delays, um, so people felt like that was just not relevant. And overall, the adherence was unfortunately very low, highlighting the importance of this issue. So I think the key lessons are that we need to move from drug level feedback to enhanced adherence counseling. Um, and we need to be as real time as possible. And we likely need to layer this type of intervention with other interventions that are likely to work to have the greatest impact. Uh, just we'll touch on treatment now uh, briefly. Uh, one use case that has come up is uh, particularly in developing countries, resistance testing is, is drastically underutilized. Um, and so here I'm envisioning a two by two table of viral load and adherence information. And if uh, when the viral load is, is high and the adherence is low, that would be an adherence problem and, and we need to do whatever interventions we can to improve adherence. Uh, when the viral load is high and adherence is high, that's a resistance problem and we need to intensify antiretroviral therapy and send resistance testing without delay. When the viral load is low and adherence is low, um, that is an interesting group in which people have not yet lost virologic control and we need to uh, leverage our resources to try to improve their adherence to avoid them running into problems. And then finally, a, a low viral load and high adherence is fine and a great expected outcome and we should congratulate people for their hard work. Um, so, um, I, I will just finish up by talking about my next steps uh, in these last two minutes. Um, I am excited to report that my K23 application was just accepted for funding. Um, <laughs> thanks. Um, and that is uh, sort of testing this this type of strategy in a in a in a here in a local setting. It's called the Prep Point of Care Brief Intervention for Adherence among Young MSM or Prep 2 Bay. Um, it's a motivational interviewing based uh, brief intervention modeled over the ESPERT model for substance use, uh, which is designed to be much shorter than the prior studies so that it's acceptable to primary care doctors, but also be um, uh, effective. And we're gonna collaborate with PrEP users and providers in the design of this and uh, planning to enroll 60 young MSM 15 to 30 into a pilot trial. Um, but I, th I see the ultimate, uh, I really do think the implementation questions here are the key ones and to do that I think we need to borrow from other fields such as implementation science. Uh, we might think about doing cluster randomized trials to test clinic level scale up of this intervention. And as I said, I think this is probably not the, the be all intervention in its own. I think it, it uh, can be used as a tool to intensify and layer on additional interventions of, of, of known efficacy. So one, one approach is the SMART uh, trial, which uh, can, can uh, systematically and sequentially test adding additional interventions uh, using the adherence test. And uh, some of those interventions which have shown promise are SMS support, um, a tool that my colleague Al Lu has developed, um, uh, alternate service delivery like adherence clubs and teleprep, and I think uh, in a second stage, potentially incentives or vouchers uh, could be indicated. So that's it, and uh, these are my acknowledgements. Thanks so much for having me. Perfect on time. Thank you very much, Matt. We have time for a few questions before we move to our second speaker. Questions for Matt? Cesar has the microphone to project. Two and one. Uh, so the question was about how would this test be used in two one one prep? I am uh, very excited about the promise of 2-1-1 prep, even if it, um, it creates some methodologic and, and implementation challenges for my, uh, my proposed uh, research program. Um, I, uh, I, I, I think 
I think I, st I just still think the strategy could be used with two and one prep, albeit um, how you understand and measure adherence is very complicated in that setting, and you do need to know the timing of sexual activity. Um, I would say the, the bias in in um, in underreporting the timing of sexual activity may be different than the bias in, in adherence, um, uh, self-reported adherence. But that said, it is a real um, it is a real challenge, and um, one advantage of having a short-term test is that it really is uh, and a cheap test is that we could do it frequently. Um, um, so in a research setting, you might think about uh, doing home-based testing and keeping a sexual diary. That's an in clinical world. I don't think I'm going to have people do testing once a, once a week, and probably other tools are needed for that group. Um, some mHealth strategies are being tested. Other questions? No. OK, then. Um, well, I think, I know I look forward to uh, hearing lots more from Matt as his K23 starts and he brings in um, lots of new innovation. So um, we are going to move on to our next speaker, which is Dr. Joanna Helmuth. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Joanna Helmuth is a neurologist with, a, with subspecialty training in cognitive and behavioral neurology. She practices at the UCSF Memory and uh, Aging Center, where she evaluates and manages patients with HIV-related cogn cognitive changes. Now a faculty member in the Department of Neurology, Dr. Helmuth has a K23 award unraveling the immunolo neuroimmunologic uh, mechanisms of HIV-associated neurocognitive disorder, or HAND. Uh, she also received a CIFAR Mentored Scientist Award in 2015, uh, which was entitled The Influence of Antiretroviral Treatment in Acute HIV on Viral Reservoir Formation in the CNS. Um, Joanna's going to be sharing her work, uh, which was tentatively titled The Impact of Very Early a ART Initiation on Plasma and Cerebrospinal Fluid Immune Activation, Implications for Central Nervous System Reservoirs of HIV. Um, Dr. Helmuth, where'd you go? There you are. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for having me this morning. Uh, again, I'm a neurologist at the Memory and Aging Center, so I am in the world of neurology, and no one else does HIV where I am. So it's actually really warming and heartening to see kind of this togetherness and community of HIV researchers and people interested in the field. So I hope to make many more of these uh, talks in the future and listen to all the work that you all are doing. Um, so I'm going to sp uh, speak briefly today about uh, the uh, impact very early initiation of antiretroviral therapy on the trajectories of uh, immune activation in both the blood but also in the cerebrospinal fluid and talk about some of the implications um, that this has for how we think about viral reservoirs. Ooh, this may not be working. We'll use some arrows here. Uh, I have a, a K23 grant and a Hillbloom Aging grant but nothing else to disclose. Um, so as everybody here knows that antiretroviral therapy has really changed the landscape of HIV. However, it's not eliminated the morbidity of HIV infection. Um, and I think that uh, one of the things we can think about is the role of persistent immune activation um, that occurs despite virally suppressive antiretroviral therapy. Um, we know that people who are living with HIV who are on virally suppressive therapy um, still have increased immune activation in their bodies and that this increased immune activation is associated with high lipid profiles, which we know uh, leads to poor cardiovascular and cerebrovascular disease outcomes. Uh, we also know that it's associated with higher risks of cancer um, and other morbidities. Uh, and as a neurologist, I really think about the implications of increased immune activation in the central nervous system, uh, in the brain compartment, um, and how that uh, can lead to poor clinical outcomes in individuals. A few years ago, a study came out that showed that after people have been on suppressive therapy for over a decade, they still, uh, that 50% of people still have elevations in cerebrospinal fluid neopterin, which is a marker of macrophage activation. Um, this really plays out in other testing modalities as well. So there was a neuroimaging study that came out a few years ago where they used a PET radioligand that attaches to microglial activation in the brain, and they found that people living with HIV on suppressive antiretroviral therapy still have this evidence of microglial activation in the brain compared to people who aren't infected with HIV. 
Um, and again, as a clinician, I really think about the clinical uh, outcomes associated with this. So um, in people living with HIV who have cognitive impairment, um, who are, again, virally suppressed on antiretroviral therapy, they have higher levels of the CSF uh, neopterin uh, than people who don't have these cognitive symptoms but are similarly infected with HIV. Um, you know, this particularly touches me because a lot of my clinical practice is people living with HIV in the Bay Area who have HIV-associated neurocognitive disorder. Uh, for those of you who don't know about it, it affects about a third of people who are virally suppressed. Um, it's, a, um, it's a constellation of mood symptoms, of apathy, of kind of having a short fuse, of, of motor symptoms, which may be some Parkinsonism, um, and a lot of cognitive symptoms, which are mostly executive functioning issues, where people have difficulty keeping ideas in their head and um, organizing and planning well. This is uh, a disorder that affects people's ability to work. I have many people who are on disability ability or on performance improvement plans at work it has an impact on these people's lives every minute of their day that they're using their brains. We don't really know the exact mechanisms of this, and we have no effective treatments for it at this point in time. But we know that there are these consistent associations with immune activation in the brain compartment. So I think it's fair to ask, why is this immune activation elevated in people living with HIV? Um, and there are many potential causes, you know, that this could be due to microbial translocation. It could be due to lifestyle factors. Part of this could be due to co-infections um, uh, by other viruses and bacteria. But I think that there's also a thought that some of this uh, persistent immune activation can occur from reactivation of viral reservoirs of HIV. So we know that there are viral reservoirs reservoirs in uh, what neurologists call the periphery, which is the rest of the body that's not the brain, <laughs> because we're, we're biased in the way we think about things. But we also know that there's likely uh, reservoirs in the brain as well that are in different cell types. In the periphery, it's mostly in T cells, but in the brain, it's mostly microglia that um, harbor the virus. We know that the uh, reservoirs in the periphery are established very early in the course of HIV infection, but we don't really know when the reservoirs in the brain are formed. Um, I can tell you that the earliest um, evidence of HIV RNA in the brain compartment I've seen is an individual who was infected uh, likely five days before we did a lumbar puncture for cerebrospinal fluid. So we know that the virus gets into the brain very early, um, or it can, but we don't know uh, kind of the amount of time that it takes to really establish that reservoir. And so in thinking about these implications for uh, clinical settings, like with HIV-associated neurocognitive disorder, I think it's also to, important to think about the implication of these viral reservoirs in the brain for HIV cure and eradication strategies. My stance is we've got to think about the brain, too. The virus infects a different cell type in the brain. The reservoirs are in a different cell type. It's got to be a strategy that gets into the brain and also doesn't adversely impact the brain. We can't really measure viral reservoirs in the brain like we do in the periphery. We can't just take a little chunk of tissue and look at it under a microscope. We have to look at the viral reservoir in more indirect ways, unfortunately. So in kind of thinking about these issues of persistent immune activation, viral reservoirs in the brain compartment, I think there's some important lessons we can learn from acute HIV infection. So this is the earliest identifiable stage of HIV infection. And then this is some work that I did uh, in Bangkok, Thailand a number of years ago. I packed up, moved to Bangkok for a while, and worked with this really amazing uh, cohort of individuals at the Thai Red Cross AIDS Research Center. Um, this is a phenomenal ongoing study that is really only able to happen in a very large metropolitan area with centralized HIV testing. They have an anon they had the first anonymous testing clinic in Asia. Basically, if individuals are found to be in this very earliest phase of HIV infection, usually days to just a few weeks after infection, um, they are contacted and asked if they want to enroll in this study. About 80% of people elect to enroll. Um, on that first day after they've been identified as HIV positive, there is a kind of a warm set of arm that's wrapped around him or at these individuals, and we go through a phenomenal battery of testing. On that first day as a neurologist, we do neurologic testing, we do brain scans, we do neuropsychological testing, we ask them if they want to do lumbar puncture, in addition to many, many other tests and blood samples. And then at the end of that first day, we start antiretroviral therapy and follow them over time. It's a phenomenal group of individuals who are doing this, and I feel really lucky to be involved. 
So we're studying uh, longitudinal markers of immune activation in these individuals. At baseline, just before they started antiretroviral therapy, and then subsequently at 24 weeks and 96 weeks. We looked in both the blood, and for those who had led us to do spinal taps, we'd, use, we'd look in the cerebrospinal fluid. And we looked at four different immune activation markers that are known to be elevated in the brain in HIV infection. And just a schematic of the study, again, a very short time between infection and diagnosis, and a retroviral therapy started very uh, quickly and sustained with time, and then we're looking at plasma and cerebrospinal fluid. And then we compared this to 18 individuals who were uninfected with HIV at a single time point, and their plasma and CSF measures. Just looking at the cohort, we had 146 individuals who provided some samplings. Fewer individuals, 89%, which is about 60% of the cohort, let us do lumbar punctures for cerebrospinal fluid. Um, the demographics really reflect the demographics of HIV in Asia. These are young men who have sex with men. Um, uh, the uh, HIV infected cohort was slightly younger than the controls. It was largely men, whereas the controls we had were 50 50 men and women. As far as estimated infection of duration, 17 days. Again, some individuals were much shorter, but this is very, very early in the course of infection. It was, again, an, uh, a median of one day until antiretroviral therapy was started. And most of these individuals are in phoebic stage, or 40% of the individuals are in phoebic stage one or two. Again, this earliest, early phase of HIV infection. These are viremic individuals who also have virus in their cerebrospinal fluid. And the pattern that we see is about two logs lower than we see in the plasma. Now, looking at some of these data that we have, I'm going to orient you. The cerebrospinal fluid, the brain fluid, is on this side. The plasma will be on this side. These are the immune activation markers over here. The green is the control data, and then week 0, 24, and 96. You'll see that CSF neopterin is elevated before antiretroviral therapy is started. But you know, within six months of starting uh, therapy, that has normalized to the same level as HIV negative controls, and that's sustained at almost two years out. Whereas um, in the plasma, we see a different picture. We see that there's elevations in neopterin, but at six months, this is not the same as HIV negative uh, individuals. They still have elevated immune activation in the body, and two years later, still elevated. So we see this difference. In the cerebrospinal fluid, it normalizes, but in the plasma, it doesn't. This pattern holds for MCP1, uh, a chemokine, and also holds for IP10, another chemokine. We also looked at um, IL-6, and we saw the same pattern in the CSF, but we actually didn't see any initial changes um, in the plasma. So what are the implications of these findings? So even with very early initiation of antiretroviral therapy, you almost can't start sooner than we started in this study. People living with HIV still may be at risk for systemic morbidity related to immune activation. Again, we still see that immune activation level elevated compared to uninfected individuals two years out. But it may be neuroprotective for the brain. You know, if HIV-associated neurocognitive disorder is caused in part by this elevated immune activation in the brain, if you start antiretroviral treatment very early, it might eliminate that outcome. It might be neuroprotective. We don't know. We're still following these individuals, but I can tell you that they're looking good for the number of years that we followed them with neuropsychological testing. They may be too young to manifest some of these symptoms. I think that there's also important implications for thinking about HIV reservoirs in the brain, though. Our data may suggest, again, if the immune activation that we see is in part due to viral reservoirs, that these viral reservoirs in the brain are formed later than the viral reservoirs in the rest of the body, and that if you intervene very early with antiretroviral therapy, you may limit or even prevent the formation of reservoirs in the brain compartment. Uh, so this is a paper that was published online in January of this year, but just recently came out in print. Um, and work like this is only really able to happen with really generous participants. These are individuals who are highly stigmatized in Thailand. Many of them lose their jobs. Many, many of them never tell their family or their partners that they're HIV infected. And they take great risks to participate in these studies. Um, and it takes a, a, a very large team of individuals uh, to make this scientific work come together. So thank you so much for your time. Questions for Joanna before she tries to run away from the <laughs> Um You were a little bit second. Over here, yes. <laughs> hey, Joanna. Hello. See you. Great talk. 
Um, I think one of the most special things about this cohort uh, is the proportion of individuals in really early FEBIG stages. And I'm just wondering if you looked to see whether there were different patterns across the different FEBIG stages. We didn't actually. I think because we saw these group effects in the CSF, we didn't explore the plasma. There was a previous study uh, that came out, uh, Irini Soretti, published in 2017, really just looking exclusively at the plasma data. Yeah. Hi, Joanna. That was yeah. great. Uh, um, Thank you. Do you think it's possible that there could be non-myeloid uh, reservoirs in the brain, uh, like T cells? Um, there's um, uh, uh, Sarah Joseph um, and Ron Swanstrom have presented some recent data mm -hmm. uh, suggesting that sometimes you can see compartmentalization of virus in the brain that does not appear to be macrophage uh, adapted. Mm -hmm. It seems to be T cell tropic. Uh, uh, and they've um, hypothesized that there may be some islands of, uh, of CD4 T cells, at least in early uh, stages of HIV, that could be enough to sustain a local um, uh, uh, reservoir in, in the brain of, uh, of T cell tropic. Yeah, I mean, I think that the narrative is that, you know, it's a macrophage tropic virus in the brain, it infects macrophages. But I think you're right, you know, you get early trafficking of T cells into the central nervous system early in the course of infection. And I think one of the challenges with looking at cerebrospinal fluid is it's just this kind of general fluid in the brain compartment. There could be these islands where you see uh, one sort of uh, virus type that's more T cell tropic. And so I think that's one of the challenges that we have in neurology is that we can't sample tissue, we can sample fluid, we can do neuroimaging, um, but we have a lot more limitations um, in kind of, kind of drilling down on some of these questions. We have time for one more question, if there's one burning or not burning. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much. Okay, so our next uh, speaker is uh, Eitan Herzig uh, from the Gladstone Institute. Um, uh, Eitan is a scientist at Gladstone in the lab of Warner Green. Um, uh, he completed his PhD in biochemistry and virology from Tel Aviv University uh, in Israel. And he uh, explores HIV latency control by a new type of CAR T cells, uh, so-called convertible CAR T cells, a really catchy, uh, catchy name. Um, uh, and this is really on the forefront uh, of what I think is really highly exciting um, uh, uh, gene-based therapy uh, for HIV cure that a lot of us think is going to be really promising. Uh, and. Um, uh, he was, he's been awarded a CIFAR Mentored Scientist Award in uh, 2018, uh, and we're really happy to have him here today to present his uh, uh, recently uh, uh, published uh, work um, uh, on convertible cars. So, uh, Eitan, uh, please uh, join us. Thank you. Okay. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning. Thank you for having me. So today I'm going to talk about our uh, ongoing project in the lab trying to reduce HRV reservoir. We all know that in order to get to at least a functional cure against HIV, you need to reduce the HIV reservoir. So we have two arms to that thing. So first of all, we need to reduce the reservoir in order to get some, some real progress. And then we need the immune system to try and eliminate those reactivated cells. The problem is that the immune system is A, uh, exhausted by the viral infection, and B, the, if you give ART not in the chronic infection, sorry, in the chronic infection, not in the acute infection, there are already viruses that are resistant to those CTLs, those killer cells in the body. So our question was, can we create better killer cells? And when we thought about it, we looked at the best techniques that are today, and the best technique there is today to make killer cells is CAR T cells. And the current CAR T cells is really uh, well established in cancer, and it has some things that we thought maybe if we take the current CAR T that is implemented in cancer and try to adapt it into our HIV reservoir shrunken uh, strategy, we might have uh, good results. So we looked at the, co the core in CAR-T, and what we saw is that, first of all, uh, CAR-T, which is a chimeric antigen receptor, has only one receptor on the surface. And once you have this receptor, it's there for life, it's always on, it kills everything that it sees that 
targeted by this receptor, and usually it's a mouse-derived single chain of V receptor. So it's not a full antibody, and it's usually more immunogenic than if you would base it on a human antibody. So what we thought was, uh, how can we improve all those things? We collaborate with a company from uh, South San Francisco called Cyphos, and the first thing that we did uh, with them was to divide this CAR-T system into two. We divided the effector cells, the CAR-T cell, and the targeting uh, part, the antibody, into two parts. And after we divided them into two, we had to connect them back in some way. So we used the natural NKG2D and MIC receptor and ligand system. And what we did was expressed on CAR Ts the NKG2D and conjugated into antibodies the MIC part or the alpha 1, alpha 2 part of the MIC A. And now this upper part, which is an antibody that, that is conjugated to a part of the MIC A, is called the MICA body. And the whole system is called convertible CAR T. Since now everything that has a MIC thing, MIC part conjugated to it, can be, con can be connected to our CAR Ts. And what we used was different antibodies called BNAPs, broadly neutralizing antibodies, that can identify and neutralize a uh, vast amount of strains, and we thought by that system we, man we will manage to uh, attack more strain of the virus, and we can even hopefully multiplex more than one uh, BNAB at a time, so we can cover the whole array of uh, virus strains. So by doing this convertible CAR-T, we managed to overcome some of the shortcomings of the, conver of the conventional CAR-T, which is a single antigen targeting. Now we can use uh, more than one antigen. It's not always on. You can just infuse the CAR T's by themselves. They are inert since we mutated both the NKG to D and the MIC A part to only recognize each other, but they would not recognize the natural NKG to D or MIC A in the body. So they are completely inert if you just inject the CAR T's by themselves or the convertible CAR T's. You see nothing in the body. Only when you add uh, increasing amount of the MICA body, of the antibody that is conjugated to the MIC A, you would see the effect of those cells killing HIV infected cells. And our system is based on human derived NKG2D, and those antibodies are from uh, HIV infected individuals, so it's supposed to be less immunogenic than the mouse derived system. Uh, so, what we did was try to look at uh, those convertible CAR-T in our system. So we used three different virus, two lab adopted and one F4 transmitted founder virus, which is more rele clinically relevant. We used two types of MICA bodies. One type that is bind, that can bind to the CD4 binding site of HIV envelope, and two that can bind to the V3 loop. We also used two negative controls MICA bodies, one that binds to uh, B cells, called rituximab, anti-CD20, and one that can bind to HER2 on cancer cells. So those two negative controls antibodies should not have any effect on our HIV-infected cells. And we also used a negative control for the CAR T cells. We used the parental CD8 that we transduced to make the CAR Ts in order to show that there is no uh, activity just by having those CD8 in the body. And we used it rather than in a context of a PBMC that usually that's what people are doing, using PBMC in order to see uh, HIV infection. We thought since the reservoir is mainly in the lymphoid tissues, we used fresh uh, human tonsils and spleen. We processed them into a single cell culture. We, infect those, we infected those cells with HIV that has a GFP tag so we can monitor uh, those infe productively infected cells. And we co-culture those cells with our convertible CAR-T for 48 hours. It's a short period of time, only 48 hours. We wanted to see, can we decrease the number of GFP-positive cells? So we, flew, we did the flow analysis of those cells, and we followed two important populations. One is the GFP-positive cells, the HIV-infected cells. We wanted to see if we have any success in killing those cells. And the other and more important population is the uninfected CD4 T cells. We wanted to see if our system is safe, because if we kill randomly all those cells, it's not really a good uh, treatment. So we followed those two uh, populations, and what we did was, starting with our uh, controls, we just add the CD8 by themselves, the parental CD8, or just the CAR-Ts, or CAR-Ts with negative control um, 
Mika bodies and what we saw is the green bars are the GFP positive cells they are set to one and you can see that when you add all those negative controls you don't reduce the number of GFP positive cells and the gray bars represent the GFP negative cells the bystander cells that we want we would not want to kill and as you can see there is no difference in the levels of the GFP negative cells or the uninfected cells and when we add the CAR T with the uh, Mika bodies that are specific to HIV, we can see in a dose dependent manner that we can decrease the amount of GFP in those cultures. It took only 48 hours to get more than 50%. Uh, we did that with other three uh, Mika bodies that we uh, developed, and as you can see, three worked really nicely, whereas 1074 is a BNAB that didn't really work, which is not surprising since we worked here with a, a transmitted founder virus. Not all BNABs gonna attack all the uh, strains that we would work, which made us think that the most important thing that we need is multiplexing. We need more than one Mika body to work, but does it really work? So what we did was planning an experiment where we would take the CAR T's by themselves and then we add two different Mika body types. So in this case we took one Mika body that was against HIV and one Mika body that was against B cells. And in our cultures we had B cells and HIV infected cells and what we did was trying to see if we managed to kill them both. So on the top panel you can see that when you just try to kill B cells with the rituximab, the anti-CD20 uh, Mika body, it kills really nicely. The same goes if you, on the lower panel if you try to kill HIV infected cells, the GFP positive cells. If you combine them in the same well, you manage to see that you can kill both the HIV infected cells and the B cells all at the same time, which means that we can multiplex, which is uh, a great result for us. Another thing that we thought is since our system is a two-part system, we have what's called a three-body collision. So we have our effector cells, we have our target cells, we have our Mika bodies. What, is, what are the kinetics? Maybe we have a problem of the Mika bodies binding to our target or binding to our effector cells. So we collaborate with a postdoc from the Weinberger lab in the Gladstone Institute and we did some time-lapse microscopy and we took photos every 30 minutes of the culture of GFP positive cells which are the HIV infected cells and the red cells are the uh, killer cells and what we saw over the course of 48 hours is that compared to the cartilage with no Mika bodies in the blue when you add the mix of Mika bodies here we use the f all four Mika bodies we see a dramatically decrease in the GFP positive cells or the HIV infected cells numbers we also saw that it takes between 10 to 15 hours for this, for this system to really find all the components. The antibody, to find the effector and to find the target, uh, but it's still in 48 hours it managed to kill most of the cells. And all of the things that I just showed you were in primary uh, cells, primary uh, productive infection, and we wanted to see what's going on with the gold standard today in the field, which is PBMCs from HIV infected individuals, can we reduce the reservoir in those cells? We don't, know, we don't really know what are the uh, strains that th those patients have, so we collaborate with uh, AMFAR, we got six PBMCs, Leukapax, from HIV infected in individuals, we isolated the CD4 and reactivate those cells, and after reactivation we combine them with our convertible CAR T for 48 hours, it's a short period of time, but 48 hours and we wanted to see if we managed to decrease the reservoir level. What we did was extracted the cell associated RNA and measured viral RNA and what we saw is that compared to the parental CD8 if we add convertible CAR T and to concentration of the Mika body we managed to get between 40 and 60 percent. This is really exciting news because this is only 48 hours and as I showed you this experiment or this system is really safe so in vivo we hope that we can manage those cells in the body for a month and even years, so we can always tap in, add more antibodies, reactivate some more cells with different LRAs that we're going to have, and then reduce substantially the reservoir. So to sum up my results here, I can, share, can say that the BNAP directed CKT effectively kill uh, productively infected cells in blood, tonsils, and spleen. I already showed you uh, today just the spleen. The CKT system is inert and is safe for the cells that are not infected. It only kills infected cells. And with cells from HIV-infected individuals, we managed to get uh, between 40 and 60% in only 48 hours. 
all those results were summarized in a paper that was published last month. This is our uh, suggestion for a cover that didn't, was not accepted, but this is <laughs> like our uh, imagination of the convertible car T that has the driver different antibodies. So I would like to thank everybody that was part of this uh, project in Gladstone, UCSF, uh, and Cyphos, and of course CFR for the funding. Thank you. Great, thanks, Eitan. Uh, uh, questions for Eitan? Uh, uh, oh, Diane. So, I mean, it's so exciting. 48 hours have you done longer exposures? So, so this is what we do right now. We do some in vivo mouse uh, model. The problem with our uh, culture is that we use uh, fresh tonsils, and they don't last for long mm -hmm. enough. Ethan, I have a question. Uh, uh, so do you think uh, the, uh, uh, the B cell follicle uh, may be a potential barrier to this approach uh, so that the, uh, did the, did the